Good afternoon to River of Life Midweek Service. Today is Wednesday and we welcome you, uh, if this is your first time, uh, listening uh, to this um, message. Uh, we welcome everyone and uh, we got a lot of ground to cover today, so we're going to get started uh, with some prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. May our hearts and our minds be girded, Lord, Father, I pray, Lord, give us understanding, wisdom, knowledge, Lord, Father, and uh, Lord, revelation to your word and what uh, you would have for us to learn this day. May it inspire us, may it change us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to be reading out of the Old Testament today, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, that would be verses 1 through 58, I believe. And um, so let's get started. I'll do all the reading. You just follow along. Uh, it is a lot to cover in this passage, 58 verses. So just follow along. Or if you'd like to just close your your eyes while I read, um, you know, try and get uh, this into uh, uh, vivid, uh, your vivid imagination. Uh, this is the story of David and Goliath. Uh, chapter 17, verse 1, it starts off with, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damon uh, between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, saying, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. Now remember that, okay? If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. There's something about the tactics of the enemy and the devil that um, he's always promising things and lying, okay? He doesn't come through with, uh, you know, any anything that he promises. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem and Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So his older brothers are involved in the war. Uh, David's job is to tend to the sheep and to provide lunch and meals back and forth in between to his brothers while they are uh, uh, there uh, prompt for war. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take the ephah and of roasted grain and then and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. 
They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, and set out. As Jesse had directed, he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things uh, with the keeper of supplies. He ran down to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites have been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Verse 26, David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him. This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab's, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. In other words, this is one of David's older brothers. Um, just harping on uh, the youngest uh, of the brothers and uh, saying, in other words, you're nosy, you should be tending to the sheep, how'd you get over here, who's taking care of the sheep, so forth. Verse 29, now what have I done, said David, can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. Saul is the king at the current time. Verse 32, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Verse 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off, verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a, a little more than a boy, glowing with uh, health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you would come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your, I'll give your flesh to the birds 
and the wild animals. Verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it, and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. With a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He, told, uh, he took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with his own, with that sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Shemarin road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. Remember what the promise of the uh, giant was to David? If uh, I lose to you, we will all be your slaves. Well, that didn't happen because everybody ran off. Verse 54, David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I do not know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. So here's the story of David and Goliath. Many, many uh, sermons have been ministered on David and Goliath. Uh, I wanted to switch it up just a little bit because you've heard this story, but I'm going to introduce you to uh, a continuation of what happened years later. Um, and I'll get to that right now, but I just wanted to let you know that our first point for today, there's going to be two points and we're just going to focus on those two points and there'll be a second part to this. You'll be hearing about that next Wednesday as we continue the story of uh, David and Goliath and the giants. Point number one, many battles you will have to fight will be on your own. It was David against a giant Philistine surrounded by spectators on both sides of the valley. It was just one giant against one young man. One key to learn in this story is that David did not rely on self-confidence. Remember that, self-confidence. But he had within his spirit, God confidence. That's what made different of a uh, David of a different caliber of a person. That's what gave David the courage to stand and be bold, even though he was not a soldier. He was not trained to ever be a warrior, but he was a sheep herder. He would tend to the sheep for his father. David learned to fight and protect the sheep he was entrusted to, to care for. 
skills and talents that God provided for him to learn at a young age to help when the time was right to face his giant. You and I have been taught certain skills and have been uh, trained by God to face certain matters and circumstances that will be useful in the future when you encounter your giant. Everything that you learn and that God allows you to come your way will eventually be put to the test at a later time to help you. Number one, to improve you. Number two, to move you forward and get you closer to your destination in life. Everything that you go through is warranted for that God can use in your life to bless you or bless another person. God always, always remember this, God always has a plan. In the story of David and Goliath, we see that it was God and David who faced Goliath. Surely I did say it was a young man against the giant, but it was a young man, his God, against the giant. Our focus is always on the height of our giants and the mountains that we face. You know, it could have gripped David's heart and said, oh my gosh, you know, back there he looked pretty small, but now that I'm facing him, now that I've run closer to them or I'm approaching him, this guy is really, really big. I may have my doubts now, Thoughts could have entered into his mind, into his heart. Fear could have gripped him, grabbed him by the legs there and, you know, just froze him right where he stood. But that wasn't the case. But we fail to remember as Christians, we fail to remember the height, the experience, the history that follows our God. He is bigger than the universe. At a thought, he can create things into existence and destroy things out of existence. He said he would never leave us or forsake us. So when you're approaching your giant, when you're running onto that battlefield, just remember how big your God is, not the giant, not the mountain, not the circumstance. Any battlefield you're walking onto God is walking on that battlefield with you. God laughs at those that would threaten you and will always assure the victory. Listen to this. God will always assure the victory if the servant is right in their heart and right standing with their God. Now, what I want to talk about just for a quick second is the condition of the heart also will uh, uh, rely or, or will cause you to prevail in any uh, battle that you might have on the battlefield. What am I saying? The condition of your heart. You must be close to God. You must not uh, be in, involved in the world. You must be separate, separate from the world. You must be given over to God for his purpose. His uh, guidance and direction must be, you must yield to this guidance and direction. And then you will be uh, prevailing in any situation against any giant, against any mountain. Amen. It's the condition of the servant's heart that helps you and decides the key factor in winning any battle. Amen. Let's move forward as we know what happened in this story and see years down the line as David is now king and settled in taking care of the daily throne responsibilities. David is now up in age and not so active in the affairs of daily battles and the requirements of being on the battlefield. But as the story of Goliath leaves us with a limited detail on the other brothers that he had left behind. The scripture talks about that David had, excuse me, that Goliath 
had several other brothers. Now, Goliath being a giant, therefore means that his brothers were also giants. The death of their brother left them enraged, the other brothers, and wanting to kill David for many years with these five giants. So let's catch up years later and bring us to the encounter where King David, elderly as he is, is being challenged by Goliath's brother to a battle to the death. Some, uh, some people uh, uh, that uh, expound on biblical uh, history and so forth say that uh, Goliath had three other brothers or he had it was a total of five giants in in in, in total um, it goes back and forth so for now let's just say that there was five including Goliath okay um, and the reason that we say that is because when David bent down he grabbed five stones one for every giant one for Goliath and his four brothers so that's why they say there was a total of five giants involved. Okay, let's move forward. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 15 through 22. Once again, I will read and just go ahead and follow. Uh, we're not going to read too much, but this is the story years down the line of facing another giant. Once again. There was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. And Ishbi Benab, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose brown spearhead weighed 300 shekels, and who was armed with a new sword, said that he would kill David. Here's one of the giants making a promise to everybody that would listen. His goal, his mission ever since Goliath died has been to kill David. But Abishai, Abishai, son of Zariah, came to David's rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. Then David's men swore to him saying, never, never again. Will you go out uh, with us to battle so that the lamp of Israel will not be extinguished? In the course of time, there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. At that time, Sebekai, the Hushaiphite, killed Saph, one of the descendants of Rapha. Here's another giant, in, uh, a relative of Goliath. In another battle, Verse 19, with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan, son of Jer, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear and a shaft like a weaver's rod. This giant also fell to another righteous man. Uh, verse 20, in still another battle which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. He also was descended from Rapha. That was the lineage of the giants. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. These four were descendants of Rapha in Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Eventually, all the giants in your life fall prey to the righteous man that you are surrounded by. And you also can defy the giants that come against you. And you also should have the faith to face any giant. Our second point and final point for the end of this um, sermon would be that number two many battles will require some assistance number one i had said that many battles will require only you to face somebody or some giant in your life number two many battles will require 
some assistance or help from somebody else. There is always an Abishai willing to help you. All you have to do is ask. Here is David. The scripture says that he became exhausted fighting the giant. In other words, the giant was having the upper hand. David was tired, lifting up his sword, swinging left to right. It dropped David to his back, his knees, whatever. He was in a very vulnerable position when out of nowhere came one of David's mighty men and kill and struck, killed and struck the giant and took care of that for David. Yet, during the course of this time, all of his men gathered together and said, David, no more will you ever put yourself in a circumstance where you will be facing another giant. We will back you up. We will step in and fight for you, with you, um, but we'd rather have you somewhere out of the picture in safety, uh, safe distance, that we can take care of these giants for you. There is always an Abishai, that is the friend of David that came to his rescue, willing to help you. You have heard of people that just do not want any type of help whatsoever. They don't know how to ask for help or the thought has never crossed their mind. I want you to take a moment and listen to me very carefully. You need to learn how to ask for help. When your back is up against the wall, when you have dropped to the floor and you are exhausted spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, whatever the case might be, and the giant is getting its, the upper hand and ready to swing that sword and cut your head off, you need to be able to reach out. You need to know who to call. You need to have um, a contact. You need to have a relationship with either a brother or a sister in the Lord, your pastor, a leader, somebody that could step in and help you fight your battle. There are brothers and sisters that are well-defined in offering their talents to pray with you or pray you through any battle with your giant. Let me say that one more time. There are brothers and sisters that are well-defined in offering their talents to pray with you or pray you through any battle with your giant. Here's a statement for you. Which is the banana that gets eaten first? Well, it happens to be the one that is left alone, separate from the bunch or the stem, because it is an easy target or an easy prey. When you get to your bananas uh, and you see one that is separated from the banana, that is the easiest one to pick from. So you don't have to be tugging and fighting and ripping off the other banana that is connected to the bunch. You just go for the easiest one. Same thing with the tactic of the enemy. He goes for the one that's by himself, separated away from the bunch. Let's talk about your giants that you might be facing or the giants that occur uh, during your spiritual encounter with your giant. A giant may be your physical illness. It might be a mental attack. Your giant may be financial burden. Your giant might be depression, anxiety, or oppression. Your giant may be the difficulties that are coming against your and your home, your personal life. Your giant might be the relationship problems that you're having. Your giant might be the work problems that you're having. Your giant may be personal problems that you're having. Your giant might be frustration, marital problems, drug addiction, heartache, problems with your parents, problems with your children, problems with your spouse, your family, your problems in your school, problems of the giants 
coming in the form of abuse and its many forms, etc., etc., etc. In ending today, the moral of this first part this week is in this presentation is that we have to deal with all our giants one at a time that is the name of the lesson today handling your giants or dealing with your giants one at a time whether we do it now or do it later whether we do it alone or with some help that falls on each one of us that falls on you that falls on me God has equipped us to always, always fight our giants. As many pop up in our life, we are meant to defeat them. Whether you do it alone or whether you do it with someone else's help, you are meant to face every giant. And, and as the movie goes and states, you never give up and you never surrender. With that in mind, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't know that he is willing to be the defender of your faith, of your life, and your salvation. He wants to introduce you today to the greatest gift, uh, which is eternal life. That is the invitation that I'm giving out today. You don't know Jesus. You've never ask the Lord to come into your heart or you never said the sinner's prayer or repent, repented, I want you to take a moment just where, you, where you're at, just bow your head and repeat these words after me, this simple prayer. Father, I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of all my sins, make me a new creature as you have invited me and prepared and planned the path for heaven through your son, Jesus Christ's sacrifice. I take this moment to accept you as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I want to do what is right. I want to live for you. I want to learn to love you. I want to learn to know you. In Jesus' name, come into my heart, Lord. Forgive me of all my past, my sins that weigh me down. Help me to start new this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You said that prayer, folks. I appreciate you taking a moment. I appreciate your patience with dealing with all this information, but it is meant for somebody to hear. Maybe it was meant for you to hear on how to face your giants. Maybe you're dealing with several giants coming against you at one same time, but I want to tell you, God is there on the battlefield for you. Until next time, the next continuation that we have will be next Wednesday for part two of this. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. You be blessed. Take care. Bye-bye.